My name is Joe Dalton, entrepreneur and business coach. Welcome to Breakthrough Brands. Each week, we bring you an inspirational story and an insight to the minds of some of the top business leaders, authors, and mentors from around the globe. Whatever is needed to make you shine in life and business, you'll find it here. Over the years, I've had the pleasure to interview hundreds of people on my business shows, Breakthrough Brands and Business Eye. In doing so, I put together my top 10 tips that I have picked up from my guests along the way. To discover what these are and how they may benefit you in your business, please click on the link below or go to joedalton.ie forward slash discover. On today's show, we have Bill Phillips. Bill is an accomplished and experienced facilitator and team performance expert with four decades of coaching, training and facilitating across four continents and 17 countries. He is renowned worldwide for creating positive thinking environments and inspiring people to take action and get results. He is an international NLP coach and leading trainer of NLP and he is Ireland's only certified instructor of the whole mind reading system called Photo Reading. Bill, welcome to Break Two Brands. How are you? Thanks, Joe. Yeah, I'm feeling great, and uh, it's really nice to be invited again. So good to yes, uh, you were on one of our other shows, which was uh, the Business Eye, um, mm. and you were talking about NLP. You were talking about photo reading. For if anyone that knows speed reading, it's quite similar to it. Mm. And you were also talking about future basing as well. Mm. Tell us a little bit about yourself. You're a very interesting guy. You've worked in some negotiation with the Red Cross. You helped them develop um, their protocol, which they're using today, Mm -hmm. and other various companies around the world. And you travel around the world as well, coaching and helping people with NLP. How how did you get into it? Mm. I don't know. I suppose my mind goes back to sort of teenage Uh, when uh, I suppose like most teenagers you start to get all kinds of feelings that you never had before and think why am I feeling like this and needing to know and needing to understand it I guess Uh, so I read lots of books I'm a bit of a reader Um, okay and uh, that's where I get lots of my information from and I studied yoga studied concentration all these things as a teenager trying to work out what's what's life all about and what's the world all about because it was deeply puzzling to me up until then. Uh, it still is deeply puzzling. It still is deeply well. puzzling, you, you, yeah. I think when, you know, I, I've realised, you know, in my 40s now, and I look back, I remember going in my early 40s, oh my God, if, if only what I knew now, if I knew 20 years ago, it would be amazing. And I say that now, and I know in the next 10 years, what I pick up on my journey, I'll be gone. My mind will be explosive because of what I, what I, I will know then. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But if you if you look on Wikipedia for NLP, there's all kinds of articles that tell you it's a fraud because eye movements don't really tell you if someone's lying or not. Um, just people misunderstanding. NLP fundamentally is a really deeply detailed study of how human beings do everything that human beings do. It started with study of geniuses saying, what makes them geniuses? Why can they do things like that that other people can't do? And how do they do that? So it was an interest in how does that work? So two people, John Grindo, Richard Bandler, they're quite famous in their field now, they did a study of three extraordinary therapists who were considered geniuses at the time in California in the 1970s. There was a big explosion of interest in understanding the mind and the unconscious and and thinking and, and spiritual pursuits and yeah. psychology and so on uh, and there was a, an intense lot of interest in that part of the world at the time and these two people studied these geniuses they spent time with them watching and listening and they started to recognize that there were patterns in their behavior specific things they did and the interesting thing was the people themselves that were using these patterns didn't know it was unconscious for them Uh, So these two managed to develop a really clever way of observing other people so you could get right inside how how were they actually doing their thinking and how could they talk to someone and get a change that all the other psychologists just couldn't do and they noticed the way they were. So what they were doing was studying 
deeply how thinking works, how memory works, how human beings use their body to communicate, not just the words they speak, but their tone of voice and the expressions on their face. And so it was a, a really very detailed study of human functioning. It's, it's interesting because it, some people will, will speak to you and they say, see how this is done, and other yeah. people will say, do you hear what I'm saying? And, exactly right. and you, you sort of pick up on them and learn them. Are you constantly all the time listening to how people are communicating or is there times when you switch it on and switch it off? Well, when you learn NLP, the whole point of studying it is to become skillful at noticing those patterns and using those patterns to build rapport, to improve the quality of your relationships and to get the kind of thinking and changes that you want to make. Which we were using in sales 20 years ago when exactly. we were trained to And be as you know, when you were first being trained, you had to really concentrate, you had to remember to practice, you had to make notes and read and, and really build your skill. But after a while, it, everything becomes automated. The unconscious is designed to automate anything that you, that you do repeatedly so that it doesn't have to use energy working it all out every single time. So after a while, it becomes automatic. You don't, it's like driving a car. Most people who drive a car don't really give any attention to the driving itself, but they had to when they were learning. Yeah, yeah. Same, same with NLP. So when you're, when you're first learning it, you're furiously concentrated. You might spend a week just listening out for each time someone uses see, look, and you ignore everything else because you're just practicing noticing that. And then you might spend another week practicing, listen, how do you like the sound of this? Yeah. And so on. Um, but then also as being an NLP practitioner, Will you then sort of mirror people? So if you're listening well, to someone... Well, that's yeah. part of the things that, that these two people observed, John Grind and Richard Bandler. They noticed that people's bodies line, align with one another when they're really in deep conversation. And what they were recognising was these very skilled therapists that they were using were, um, were doing yeah. exactly that. They were copying. But one of the things they discovered, which was even more subtle, was when they were observing these therapists, they were in the room watching a therapist work with their clients, for example, they obviously couldn't mirror the therapist and, and so on because it would have looked ridiculous. So they learned how to mirror by imagining they were the therapist. Ah, and what's yeah, really peculiar yeah. is when you imagine you're inside the body of someone else, your body makes microscopic adjustments. We call them micro-muscle movements yeah. to adjust to that that in and their unconscious attention picks that up. Consciously, they'd never notice it, but their unconscious attention picks it up. So there's a kind of subtle mirroring that we use in the form of NLP I do, which is completely out of the range of detection, if you like. So how can I put it? It's irresistible, because you'd have to be conscious of it to resist it. Is, is it like the, the, the case study where you know, 10 people were played the piano and then there was 10 people who imagined they were playing the piano and then they put them in the room and they both were able to play the same? That's, is it that that's, sort of that's a different um, process. But yes, it, I mean, you're using the same bits of your circuitry to do that, to that visualising, imagining you're in someone else. We call it in, in NLP, we call it second positioning. In my own body, looking out my own eyes, I consider that as being first position. If I'm imagining I'm Joe Dalton looking over at Bill Phillips, then I'm second positioning. If I can imagine I'm another person in the room looking at Joe and Bill, then I'm in a third position. Looking yeah, in. looking and, at And these are ways that you learn how to do uh, with NLP because people do these things naturally anyway. And some people make remarkable uh, changes and choices when they can step outside themselves and look in from the outside or see the world through someone else's eyes if you like it's interesting because um as a, a practitioner myself of martial arts mm -hmm. uh, and going in and looking at say when you would come in up to an opponent you would be future basing mm -hmm. what you what was going to happen do you know okay i'm going to do this he's going to do this mm -hmm. then i'm going to and it but you would then subconscious mind would just trigger in and you would do it automatically i was just going to say because yeah. what happens is if you make up your mind what's going to happen you've lost mm. you've lost already yeah because it doesn't work like that um, but it's 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 because uh like with wing chun it's muscle memory indeed S yeah so, so you so practice 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 so your body knows all the movements it can make yeah and then you know, they talk about this state of no mind. And, of course, no Japanese could ever explain what they meant by that. And yeah. no Westerner could ever get it. Yeah. But 
in NLP, we learn this state of no mind, which is this ability to watch and listen with 100% of your attention out there. And you just wait and see what happens and you respond to whatever happens. And because you practiced so many times all your different responses, then there's always something good that's going to come out. And we help people make a connection when they're facing a challenge, for example. We show them how they can connect a high performance state or set of reactions to that challenging situation. And what happens then, they don't know what's going to happen, but they go into the challenging situation and some kind of miracle happens. They say the right thing or they make the right movements. Well, yeah, um, and that's that's to do with the, the person's state of mind. You can get up exactly. in the morning and go, I'm going to have an amazing day. Mm-hmm. Or you can get up in the morning and go, I'm going to have a shit day. Yeah. And how that day will work will depend on what your mood is in the morning or you switch it. Absolutely. But it also then gets back to, you know, where people, they say, oh, I'm terrible, I'm bad luck and everything is running. Mm-hmm. There's stuff that's triggered in their mind from years. It's like the, the, the person who gets into the bad relationship and leaves that relationship and goes into another relationship, which is a bad relationship, yeah. because without them re- realising, their body and their mind is going, this is okay. This is what you're used to. They recognise it. Yeah. Yeah. So, right. can NLP as well help people in such a way to change their own habits and get them to live the life that they want to live as well? Exactly, and that's what's so marvellous about NLP and why it really, literally, has spread into every walk of life yeah. since the 1970s. Just because of that, because it was a recognition that yes, you can do it, and there are specific ways to do it so when you learn NLP you learn these kind of technical you learn technical um, methods for helping people if you like imagine they can go back into their past and change what happened and then come back to the present as if their life had been different and so somebody can have a belief that was installed when they were three years old for example they can go back to the minute before that happened when they were three years old when they'd not had that experience change everything that happened as if they'd had the resources to deal with it and then come back through their life to the present as if they'd had a completely different life because that had never happened to them. Yeah. So you can help people change because memories are only imagined. They're not, they're not real. Memories aren't stored in the way that most people think. Memories are reconstructed every time we think of them. Yeah, but memories are there to design as well to, for us to forget. Because if we were yeah. to take every bad memory we had in our head, yeah, but there's a part it. of yeah. it that somewhere goes into some memory bank and something will trigger exactly. that. And that's what it is. It's similarity in something happening now that think, oh, that reminds me of, you know, like a smell reminds you of grandma's kitchen or yeah. something like that. Yeah. Um, so those are mechanisms built in. They're survival mechanisms. Um, but just listen to you there. And looking about all the books, the self-help promotion books, all the sales books, all the marketing books, they're all really driven from a mindset of NLP. Well, NLP's pervaded everything. Yeah, yeah. And, it's, and so, it's, it's, and so yeah. like you talk about your sales training, so well, I've been doing NLP. Well, nobody had ever heard of such a thing before the 1970s. Since the 1970s, when NLP was spread around, Everyone knows about mirroring. Everyone knows about using language and and seeing and hearing and feeling. But in those days, that kind of concept was foreign. Psychologists didn't know that stuff, so they didn't use it. Yeah, because it's always been there. So it was only just nobody recognised it. No one recognised it, and only then did someone kind of go, "Okay, let's look at this." That's it. And that's what NLP is really is is the revelation of all those things that we did without knowing we were doing them and giving us the awareness to learn how to do them on purpose. So if you deliberately mirror someone, if you deliberately match your words to theirs, so when they're saying, look, let me show you what I mean, you say, so how do you see it then? What you're doing is that's another form of mirroring. You're mirroring what they're talking about. You're picking their language patterns and making the same. Yeah, it, and it's like where in, if we, in the sales process, we'd never ask anyone what the, what they think because people hate to think. Their mind just explodes. Exactly. But you ask them what is their opinion yeah. and people love to give their opinion. Exactly. Because it's That's less it. threatening. That's it. And yeah. when you know that, you use it on purpose yeah. because you know it works. And that's what NLP is. is NLP is a study of what works so that you can use it with the intention of helping people. And as, as John Grinder, my teacher, says, look, there's only one justification for asking people questions, is to promote a nonverbal response. And there's only one justification for practicing NLP, and that is to give people more choice. 
in their lives. If somebody doesn't end up with more choice, what the hell are you doing? It's certainly not NLP as far as he's concerned. It's like the word because. If you throw yeah. because into a situ into a well, that, sentence, that it's... shows you a pattern in thinking, which is we call it cause and effect. I feel like this because you did that. I'm I have this problem in these days because my parents told me that when I was a kid, yeah. and so we connect things, and then we live our lives as if those things are connected. You make me happy, you make me sad. That can't actually happen. That's incorrect. But we live our lives as if it's true which is where lots of our pain and difficulty comes from. So an NLP practitioner or a coach is going to say, so you said that because of that. How do you connect those two? Yeah. And what if you were to disconnect them, recognising that although that person says something really unkind to you, the only reason you feel sad is because the way you interpret their meaning gives you sadness. But you're the one who's doing sad, not them. Quick break and we'll be right back then. Over the years, I've had the pleasure to interview hundreds of people on my business shows, Breakthrough Brands and Business Eye. In doing so, I put together my top 10 tips that I've picked up from my guests along the way. To discover what these are and how they may benefit you in your business, please click on the link below or go to joedalton.ie forward slash discover. And welcome back to Breakthrough Brands. Bill, I want to just jump back. You worked with the Red Cross. Tell mm-hmm. me what you did and how how it occurred that you got you got to help them with their negotiations. Okay, yeah, the, it was. Um, it stemmed from work I was doing in, in the mid nineteen eighties when I was a training manager at Manchester Airport in the UK. I was building their training system and the training department for the management team and for the running of the company. And um, I was trained in a team building method. And one of the authors of this team building method authored a book called How to Influence Others at Work. And he decided to run a trainer's training in the, the model that he created. But what he'd done was just taken the basics of NLP and applied it to influencing people at work. So that was my first proper introduction to NLP in 1988. And that was a three-day training, and then he came back a year later and did a certification based on how well we'd used it. And I'd gone out and bought all the books in his bibliography. There were 17 of them, I think. Read every single one of them cover to cover and then put it all into practice. Blew your mind. It was fantastic. It, It explained so many things for me, so many things about other people's behaviours that puzzled me and my own behaviours and all of a sudden NLP said there it is, that's the jigsaw puzzle complete and I thought yeah now it makes sense and that's what excited me most so with the Red Cross just about that time I developed a way of thinking, I stumbled upon it because of a problem I had which was creating a personal three year development plan and I developed this technique that I now call future basing, I mean, mm. it's about basing yourself in an ideal future and looking back that how you must have got here, so to speak. And I was running, on behalf of this author, I was asked to run uh, a How to Influence Others workshop commercially for them um, because he couldn't get over from Australia to run it himself because he was based in Australia. And um, so I ran this workshop and two of the people on the workshop were worked in the Central Training Division of the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies. And... Because Dick McCann, this author, had been interested in my future basing method, I mentioned it to these people and they said, oh, we've got something coming up which that would be ideal for. Would you be interested in coming and doing some pro bono work? So I said, yeah, of course. It'd be, it'd be delightful. So I went over to Switzerland and there was the, um, the Secretary General, the three under secretaries, and 50 of the top NLP leaders and managers from around the world chief executives of national societies and so on. And their job was to look 13 years ahead at the end of 2010, which was 1997, and create a vision of the worldwide Red Cross movement. And so they asked me to facilitate this meeting, and uh, so, which I did, and it seemed to work extremely well, because they used that vision to base their 10-year operating plan for the year 2000 to 2010. And on the back of that, somebody said to me, there's an advisory commission meeting next month. Would you be available to come and do a similar thing with them? There's about 30 people in it. He said, they've got a bigger problem because they've been meeting every year for the last 15 years trying to create an agreement and failing. (laughs) But he said, I I think that technique that I've just seen you use, I'm sure that could work. So we use future basing for this 
this discussion, which was about there are two parts to the Red Cross. There's the original Red Cross, um, the Swiss Red Cross. They call it the International Committee of the Red Cross. They're the ones who go into war zones and make sure people follow the, the Geneva Conventions and that um, refugees are catalogued and taken care of. And then there's all the national societies around the world um, and there's a federation of them, so they have their own secretariat in Geneva. So you've got the ICRC, the committee, and the IFRC, the federation. They're two separate organisations, but in the Red Cross movement. And so when there's a war, and let's say there's a war going on in a country, and then there's a, a natural disaster like an earthquake or a flood, which is not unusual, who's in charge? The yeah. National Society or, or the, the committee? And they'd never worked out a way of organising themselves when those mixed up things or when the war ended and everything was going to be handed over to the national societies to get the refugees back home and rehabilitate the country, who was in charge? And so they, they were trying to come to an agreement that there's a standard procedure, a protocol for that. And we managed to do that in a, in a night and a day using my technique, future wow. basing. They didn't realise they'd done it, but apparently the following day when I left, they sat down and said, right, now we're going to have to start writing this protocol. And somebody said, actually, this is it. We've, This is it. We've already got it. All we need to do is just fill out the forms. And the, so that was ratified in Seville, and they call it the Seville Agreement, and that's still in operation so these days. You must feel proud of that. It's rather nice, actually. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's a nice badge of honour, isn't it? Part of your yeah. legacy, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess, yeah. yeah. So what is future basing? What is it? What is, what is it? Is it is it goal setting, or is it much more? Well, some more? people might use it for that. Um, the way it arose, uh, I, I attended a training course by the Dale Carnegie Organization, which of course is very famous. Yeah, that's where and, my and sales trainer was one of the first sales yeah, training guys with them. That's they're pretty uh, damn good at it yeah, as well. Yeah. And um, so, as part of this kind of um, six week, one evening a week management course. Uh, we were we were asked to produce a personal three-year development plan and then come back the following week and say, here are the bare bones of my plan. This is where I'm going for the next three And I couldn't do it. Here I was, the training manager at a major airport, and I'd never done a personal development plan for myself. I was helping plenty of other people do it, but not me. And I'd, in the end, I made a mess of it. And I thought, no, I'd, um, I'm not even going to attempt to do this. So I just wrote a load of nonsense. I wrote down all these things that I'd love to have but weren't going to happen. I got a master's degree. I couldn't have because I didn't have a first degree. I, um, I'm friends with people whose books I read. I'm becoming famous in my industry. All kinds of silly things like that. What I didn't realise until a couple of years later was I'd written all of that in the present tense. I don't know why, because... The plan that I was filling in said, where will you be in three years' time and what will you have to do and so on. So it was all written in the natural future language. But I'd written it in the present tense. I have a master's degree. I am friends with these people. I love doing this. Eighteen months later, I was coaching a young man who worked in the airport hands division, you know, loading the planes, and he wanted to become a manager. And I got to a point where I said, hey, Bob, listen, there was a planning technique I used a couple of years ago. It didn't actually work for me, but I think it would work really well for you because you have that organised kind of mind that I don't have. So I showed him the forms, and then he still wasn't sure. So I said, well, look, let me show you what I filled in. At least it gives you an idea of how to write it. And I was looking over his shoulder thinking, hang on, this can't be right. I am on a master's degree course, and I am friends with it, and so on. So all the things I'd written... 18 months before, were actually real now. And I thought, that's not possible, because when I wrote them, they couldn't happen. How come they're happening now? And that set off a big train of thought, which lasted about 18 months, two years. That's like where yeah, I gradually the apple hitting you in the form. head. Yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so I formalised it, because I recognised as well that people who are very kind of global thinkers could do that easily, imagine it's the future. People who are not, who are very linear, structured thinkers need a set of rules to follow because their brain just doesn't go there. So I created a structure and that's really a, a, a strict structure of future basing and discovered that I had a method which didn't only work for individuals, helping you imagine the kind of future you want and then just let it go and it turns up. But when you work with a group of people, it's structured in such a way you can have 20, 30, 50 people in a room and you can get them to think together and come up with a joint vision. I don't know of any other visioning technique that actually does that. It's 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 like uh, you make that decision that you want something to happen. So you set that intention. Yeah. But it's also, it's setting the intention, 
and then forgetting about it in a way and that's just right. letting it happen. That's what they call the law of attraction these yeah, days. But, yeah, that's but right, yeah. It actually, the technique, when I, when I started studying it and researching to see if anyone else was doing anything similar, which in those days they weren't, um, what I realised was it emulated the way certain creative thinkers, entrepreneurs would think. Um, I remember visiting one entrepreneur in a factory in, in Huddersfield when the market for worsted suiting materials had collapsed and he was expanding his factory, making more and he said, I'm filling the space that other people are leaving by pulling out of the industry he said, now in that big factory space down there, I'm going to have five machines, I'm going to have this many and he, he drew me a word picture of what it was going to be like and I thought, he's future basing that was a f- brilliant example of this way of thinking and I recognised that it worked because people already use that without knowing they're doing it, that's their way of thinking uh, and making successful businesses. So I thought, well, if I use it for people in business, won't it help them be more successful? And sure enough, I mean, I, I guess I've made my living um, from it uh, for many years, really. And all the work I did with the Red Cross was using Future Basic. Mm. So It's fascinating, actually, because, you know, we spoke to you today about Joe Dispenza and the way he's developing... Uh, a technique which is changing pe- people's minds, changing their habits, mm. and he sort of he he brings it in as you know, this is sort of like he brings meditation in and getting people to change it, and it's it's like it's a spiritual thing, mm. but it's it's really reality. It's really mm. NLP. It's mm. future basing. It's everything. Well, Joe's an NLP trainer, yeah, and that's where he yeah. started, and then what he's done because he's also an entrepreneur and a very clever businessman. He's taken pieces of NLP like Tony Robbins and turned it into something which is his and branded it in certain ways. And so it's no longer recognisable as NLP derived, but nevertheless, it's just brilliant thinking. And but from the guy in the street and the person that's listening to this as well, if you look at all the motivational speakers and look at everyone in sales and look at whatever is going out there, it's all related. It's all sort of falls so back to the human stuff. conditioning. Exactly yeah, that. Just, and just all NLP is is an observation of that and say, look, here's the code. Yeah. Well, okay. So you've got the NLP, you've got the future basing, you've got photo reading. Hmm. What is it? Well, photo reading is derived from NLP because the man who invented it, a chap called Paul Sheely in the US, is an expert in accelerated learning. And he was asked, could he... Um, produce a speed reading course which used accelerated learning technology and because he'd been trained in NLP he thought there's a lot of unconscious work involved in learning how can I use the unconscious in this process and he developed a way of downloading a book if you can imagine you know like you download a file from the internet if you can imagine downloading a whole book or report just like that into your unconscious mind and then go in there searching like a search engine to find what you need to find from that book or that material. That's a very different approach from speed reading. So it's basically you're using the unconscious mind, and in fact he calls it the whole mind system, the photo reading whole mind system, because he says you're using all of your mind, not just the tiny tip of the iceberg. The thing about speed reading is speed reading is fully conscious. It's just normal reading but doing it faster. Um, One of the ways that you can actually do reading faster is skim over and not see all the words. With photo reading you see everything but you see it at very high speed so because one of the interesting things that was discovered in NLP observations is the unconscious functions on patterns. It's a pattern recognition machine. That's what human beings are and so our unconscious is taking in the patterns of our environment all the time. If you turn over the pages of a book, a page a second looking at a double page spread you're going to expose your eyes to 30,000 words a minute, if not more. Now, it's not reading in the sense, because you're just seeing, you're not reading. And in fact, you look at the book with a very special kind of focus, so you're in like a kind of light learning trance, if you like. So you download the book into your unconscious mind, and then you you always read with a purpose as well. So you don't ever read without knowing, why am I going to read this, and what do I want to do with the information? If I don't know that, I won't bother, I'll leave it till later. So you read with a purpose, that's giving information to your unconscious, look for this, please. So then when you do the photo reading, then you come to the conscious part afterwards is you scan and survey the book 
to remind yourself what's there. And then you come up with a series of specific questions, which are the questions you have about, this is what I need from this book. So if you can find the answers to those questions, you've done the book. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally, because the average person reads can read a book for 20 minutes and then they sort of switch off. They put it down and then it'll yeah. pick up again and read it 20 That's minutes. It. Yeah. And they might spend three weeks doing that yeah. to get through a whole book, yeah. right? 20, 30 hours. The nice thing about photo reading is you never spend more than maybe five, ten minutes concentrating. Mm -hmm. Ten minutes is the longest in this, what we call the post view, where you're surveying the book to come up with these questions. And that's just a simple mechanical process. Yeah, it's how the mind adapts. It's, I've noticed that when I started listening at Audible probably about a year ago, and now what I'm, I'm retaining more information now exactly. than I ever before, because my yeah. brain, my mind has adjusted to getting this information in. So exactly. I'm picking up all this information really quickly. Yeah. And because it's I'm I'm listening to the book, I can walk the dog, I can I'm in the car, I'm picking up two, three hours at a time and mm -hmm. I'm picking the information up. Exactly. And that's what this is. You're you're just okay, twenty minutes flying through it. Oh, no. well, right. well, well, the, the photo reading phase itself, I mean, if you've got a 200 page book, the photo reading phase is going to take you a minute and a half. And in fact, you read the book twice because you flick over the pages and then you turn it upside down and do the same thing backwards. So your brain can can process all of those patterns. And one of the curious things that, that really amuses people when we train them in photo reading is when you've come into, OK, so I'm going to look for the answers to my questions. I'm going to activate this book now. Uh, so you, you're getting consciously what you're looking for. It's curious that very often you can think, right, the question is blah, 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 and you open the book and there's the answer on the page where you're open. Yeah, it's it's one of the things, you, you'll, you know, people are listening to this now will pull a book up and they'll flick through it and they'll turn it upside down and flick through yeah. it, but there's more to it than, than that. Exactly. You've developed a sort of a process. So you've now come up with a, a product which incorporates NLP. It also then builds in future pacing mm -hmm. and it also then the photo reading. And what did you call this? Was it the... Yeah, the Trusted Leaders Toolkit. People want to find out about this and how they can get in touch with you and for you to train them on it. Where can they find you on this? Is it Bitner Phillips or...? It is. Bill at bitnerphillips.com is uh, my email address. That's the best, most immediate way to get me so that I can talk about it. The Trusted Leader Toolkit is a mixture of NLP. It keeps you just off the edge of your comfort zone, yeah. building an amazing set of skills, the set of skills that are required to build rapport with people, to interact with them, and to learn how to trust yourself first and then be congruent as you trust others. Okay. Uh, so it combines NLP, photo reading, and the skills that we use for conflict resolution, which actually are exactly the same skills for negotiation. So it's understanding how the structure and organisation of negotiation as it really works. Well, I guess uh, I've been interested in management and leadership for nearly 40 years yeah. now, um, certainly from my days in Manchester Airport. Um, and I've, I've lost count of the numbers of models and styles and explanations for what is leadership and what it's all about. Um, so leadership is one of those words that gets used an awful lot and people don't take, pay too much attention to the exact meaning of it. But there are people in charge of big budgets, of big responsibilities, of big groups of people, chief executives, executive directors, people that are in charge of making things happen and when they don't happen, it can be disastrous for, for in many ways. So they're the people I'm aiming at. And one of the things that I've been aware of over the years is the issue of trust. Uh, and so with all the different leadership models, there aren't many of them that say, you know what, if, if you don't trust the leader, they're not going to lead you. You're not going to follow. And so trust itself becomes an issue. And, and I think there are more and more... Uh, very clever people in the last few years have started to focus on trust, trust being an issue. And what they started to discover is in companies where there's a culture of trust, where the people that work there trust the people that run the company and give them their direction, if you like, and where the people who are running the company trust their staff. I mean, back in the 1980s, Jan Carlsen was um, the chief executive of SAS, uh, the, the Swedish airline. And he decided that it was really important as a customer-oriented um, idea 
to give to trust all of the staff the 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 air crew for example the 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 uh, waitresses on a plane that if she accidentally spilt coffee on someone's pants she could say we'll pay the bill so he gave all of his staff the choice and the responsibility if they wanted to do something w which would improve the experience for their customers they could do it they could spend the money it was authorized automatically and it immediately increased their turnover of their business i think it nearly doubled their business in less than two years wow it's trust that's what it's it is trust. It's, and it's, that's what he said yeah. we i'm going to trust our staff we employ them after all we pay them salaries we depend on them to run the business they're the ones who talk to the customers we need to trust them i do trust them i want to trust them and the staff just responded to that as yeah we'll have some but, of that yeah but everything everything even the sales process of marketing it's it's all about trust do i trust this person to do exactly. what i want them to do that's what everything yeah. and I just want to jump back quickly. Left and right brain. Mm -hmm. Are you connecting with this, um, the Fudgery. Trusted Leaders mm -hmm. Toolkit, okay. are you connecting the left and right brain mm -hmm. so people get more in a shorter period of time? Exactly that. I mean, one of the things about the way I teach NLP and train NLP is John Grinder's very clever. He's an amazing thinker. And, and what he teaches us trainers of NLP to do is to, to layer in what's coming next. We call it inductive learning. We emulate what happens with small children where we take in everything all at once. The unconscious is picking up everything. Yeah. But when we focus our conscious mind, we see very little. Uh, and so mo much learning, much leadership training is all about the conscious, obvious, calculated models, if you like. Even the idea of trust, there's a kind of logic to it. But actually, trust doesn't come from the logic. It comes from the unconscious signals you send to somebody. Mm. That's the, that's the right fear. brain doing that. That's exactly that. It's the right brain that's doing that. The right brain is in charge of running your body, running all your systems. It's what we think of as the unconscious part of our mind. Um, and the left brain is, if you like, the conscious, calculating, linear, linguistic side. So all the language structures are on the left-hand side of our brain. There's no language structures for the structure and the syntax of language on the right hand side. So, and that's what the, the sort of split brain experts yeah. discovered was the two halves of the brain were doing very different things. Even though they had to work together, they, they, they couldn't operate separately. That was what happened with the, the patients where they were separating people's brains, that they could still live their lives without having epileptic seizures every 10 yeah. minutes, but they couldn't function normally anymore. You know, there was strangeness in, in their functioning. But they discovered the kind of this, the division of labor between the two halves of the brain. There's actually an extraordinary writer called Ian McGilchrist who um, wrote a book called The, M the Master and His Emissary. And it's a, it's a metaphor about the emissary being, you know, the, the, the king's representative who goes and cares for a region and then ends up taking over it and acting as if he's a king himself and it's the metaphor for the left brain the conscious side of the brain thinks it's in charge and the right hand side of the brain which is the unconscious which runs everything and gives permissions is in charge but we've misunderstood and we're running the world on the left brain and what he's saying is it's really bad for society we're we're diminishing as human beings if we don't recognize it's the right brain it's our intuition it's our unconscious feelings that run the show is that our education that's down that to us yeah i was thinking that this morning actually i think our education kind of um prepares us for mediocrity uh, yeah well uh, it's industrial age education that we're still left, using today where we've evolved yeah, yeah it's left brain it's minimizing people and their capabilities rather than showing what's possible so you're teaching people then in, within your program to use both sides of the brains oh absolutely we're using both sides of the brain to learn how to use both sides of the brain. And photo reading is just an example of it. Yeah, it's yeah. using those methods for acquiring information from reading material. Your techniques that you use in NLP to teach people are more advanced or slightly different than what other NLP uh, practitioners are doing as well. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, John Grinder and Richard Bandler worked together originally for about, what, six, seven years, 1972, 79. And then at that point, they decided they were really functioning too differently and they, for various reasons, decided to part company. 
Cain John, and Abel. Yeah. Well, John was a linguist. John was the man who brought the recognition of language patterns and the effect of words on our unconscious and so on, uh, and this observation method, which he'd learned in US intelligence services because he'd been an intelligence officer many years before. Um, and what John did was recognise that a lot of the observations he and Richard made had mistakes in them. And so he said, look, this, there are too many things that are not quite right. I, I want to look at this again. He was noticing many practitioners were using their NLP on other people but not on themselves. They were incongruent. You know, yeah. overweight people doing weight loss training for, 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 for example, route, yeah. as, as a crude example. Question I have for you, we're we're coming to the end. Mm. What do you do on a daily routine yourself when you get up in the morning to practice all this as well? Do you do meditation or what? Is there something that you do every morning that enhances your day? Yeah, I do. Uh, I've recently discovered a particular technology that enhances meditation. So I've meditated for many years because of teaching what, you know, doing what you teach. Um, And it's called Holosync. It's to do with these binaural beats. You know, that they, they set up a rhythm, yeah. uh, audible rhythms that are slightly out of sync so that they create these theta and alpha and delta brain states. Yeah. Uh, and what they reckon is this speeds up the effects of meditation by eight times. And so words. I've been working with that for about a month now. And so every morning, first thing is light goes on, headphones, one hour on. lying there meditating or I'd sit up and sit and meditate and first thing and interesting if someone wanted to find that they can find it on your website as well yes that, that oh, sound yeah. as well mm-hmm. yeah okay yeah, yeah. and where can people find you where? you can look up my coaching background on billphillipsconsulting.co.uk um, my email address I always welcome a contact through email is bill at bitnerphillips.com bitnerphillips is spelled B I T. N E R Phillips dot com. And LinkedIn? Yeah, and LinkedIn as well. I have a LinkedIn profile. I've no idea what the. Uh, what the <laughs> I, I the know that uh, yeah. Bill Phillips, if you Google Bill Phillips, you get a weightlifter. That's right. Yeah, he's very famous in <laughs> yeah. America. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's it. yeah, yeah. so my, my one ends with NLP as slash NLP. NLP at the honest, end. Yeah. That, that way you know it's me. What's the best business advice that you've received? I don't know if I'll call it advice, but I, I remember a meeting with, uh, it was having dinner in, in Switzerland one night with um, an Italian billionaire, a man who appeared to own half the world. And he was saying, you know, when I'm hiring people, he said, and clearly in my business, the people I hire are really, really important. He said, and I have a killer question, which always gets me a great result. He said, and he said, the question is, do you have any defects? And then I watch. If I ask it to you, he said, do you have any defects? And then he looked at me like this. So I said, well, yeah. I said, actually, I tend to trust people very readily. And sometimes it gets me into trouble. And he just looked at me silently for a few moments. And he said, that's a very good answer. He said, and you know what? You can't do good business without trust. Yeah, yeah. That's it. It was funny. We were talking about that on another show about trust. Yeah. And we were talking about values and have good values and live by those values. Yeah. yeah it's interesting. Because exactly if you yeah. do that, I mean, you're congruent. And when you're congruent, you're easier to trust than when you're not. Yeah. Yeah. We kind of get confused by mixed messages, don't we? What book would you recommend for people to read? There's a most beautiful, simple book that I've given to so many people. And they've said, oh, my God, that book changed my life. And it's a simple one. It's called Stop Thinking, Start Living. Interesting. It's a fantastic read. Very yeah. easy to read. Strongly recommend it by a man called Richard Carlson. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah beautiful yeah, book. Yeah, um, it's it's similar like the lives of the power of now, isn't it? Really, yeah. It yeah. is. It, yeah. Although it's it's almost like the power of happiness. What it says is, happy. What we think of as happiness is our natural state, and it's not hilariously happiness. It's just simply feeling fine. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. And he said, it's a bit like the sunshine behind the clouds. The clouds might be there, it might be raining, it might be windy, you might be miserable with the weather, you might be cold. But when the clouds clear, the sun's never, ever anywhere else but there. Like and that. happiness is always there inside, ready for you to reveal it when you stop thinking. Beautiful. And on that note, what song do you want us to play it with? No, I like that. I love Bill Withers' song, It's a Lovely Day.
You can guess why. <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah. Bill Phillips, thank you for coming on to Bright Two Brands. Thank you for having me, Jen. Over the years, I've had the pleasure to interview hundreds of people on my business shows, Breakthrough Brands and Business Eye. In doing so, I put together my top 10 tips that I've picked up from my guests along the way. To discover what these are and how they may benefit you in your business, please click on the link below or go to joedalton.ie forward slash discover.